Winter, 1161. The Yangtze River cuts through China like a frozen blade. On its dark waters, massive warships glide forward in perfect silence. No flames flicker on their decks. No smoke rises from their hulls. Yet inside, hundreds of sailors work in warmth and comfort, while their enemies shiver and die in the bitter cold. But here's the thing. These ships were made entirely of wood. One spark could turn them into floating funeral pyres. So how did ancient Chinese naval forces keep their crews alive and fighting on icy seas without using fire? The answer saved an empire, and it reveals a forgotten chapter of medieval warfare that changed the course of history. This story emerges from cross-referenced historical chronicles, archaeological findings, and documented military records spanning centuries of Chinese naval development. In the winter of 1161, the Southern Song Dynasty faced complete annihilation. 600,000 Jin Dynasty warriors had marched south, their cavalry unstoppable on land, their ambition limitless. Only the Yangtze River stood between them and total conquest. The Song had no choice but to make their stand on water. Their survival depended on a navy that could operate in conditions that would cripple any other force of the time. What happened next would demonstrate that sometimes the most decisive victories come not from superior numbers or stronger weapons but from solving problems that others never even considered. To understand how the Song Dynasty developed their remarkable heating methods, we must first see the world that demanded such innovation. By the 12th century, China had fractured into two hostile empires. The Jurchen Jin Dynasty controlled the north with their fearsome cavalry, warriors who had conquered the original Song capital and driven the imperial court into exile. The Southern Song found themselves trapped in a geographic prison. Mountains blocked expansion to the west and south. The sea offered trade routes, but no escape from their enemies. And to the north, the broad Yangtze River became their final line of defense. This forced transformation changed everything. The Song abandoned their traditional focus on land armies and poured resources into naval development. They built shipyards along the coast recruited sailors from fishing communities and turned their greatest weakness, being cut off from the northern plains, into their greatest strength. Meanwhile, the Jin dynasty grew confident in their dominance. Their horses could outrun any enemy. Their archers could strike from distances that infantry couldn't match. But horses don't swim and cavalry charges don't work on water. The Jin would learn this lesson at a terrible cost. By 1160, the Song Navy had become something unprecedented in medieval warfare. 52,000 sailors operated a fleet of over 300 warships, each one a marvel of engineering that wouldn't be matched in Europe for centuries. These weren't the simple boats that most people imagine when they think of ancient ships. Song war junks stretched over 100 feet in length, with multiple decks and watertight compartments that could keep them afloat even when damaged. Marco Polo would later describe Chinese ships with 60 separate cabins, each one furnished for comfort during long voyages. But the real breakthrough was in how they managed fire and heat. Chinese engineers had perfected a system of contained heating that eliminated the deadly risk of open flames. They used charcoal braziers, metal containers that could burn fuel without producing visible fire or dangerous sparks. These braziers sat on beds of sand or brick, safely radiating warmth throughout the ship's interior spaces. The system went far beyond simple heating. Sailors carried small hand stoves filled with glowing coals, devices they could slip into their sleeves or place under bedding during cold nights. Ship kitchens used enclosed iron stoves with carefully designed ventilation that allowed cooking without the fire hazard that plagued other navies. What made this possible was the sheer size and sophistication of song ships. While European vessels of the time were essentially large boats, Chinese war junks were floating fortresses with the internal space needed for complex heating systems. The difference wasn't just technological, it was conceptual. 
The song understood that keeping crews comfortable and healthy was as important as any weapon they could carry. As song engineers perfected their naval technology, a new threat emerged in the north. Emperor Wan Yanliang of the Jin Dynasty was not content with controlling half of China. He had seized power through violence and betrayal, and now he needed a great victory to legitimize his rule. Wan Yanliang looked south toward the prosperous Song territories and saw weakness. The Song paid tribute to avoid war. They built ships instead of training cavalry. They seemed more interested in trade than conquest. To a warrior emperor, this looked like cowardice. The Jin began preparing for invasion with methodical efficiency. They conscripted every able-bodied man, assembled vast supply trains and moved their armies toward the Yangtze. Wan Yanliang was so confident of victory that he brought musicians and luxury goods to celebrate his triumph in the Song capital. But the Song were not the weak merchants that Wan Yan Liang imagined. As Jin forces approached the river, Song commanders activated a naval defence system that had been years in the making. Ships moved into position along the Yangtze. Weapons were loaded and tested. Most importantly, crews prepared for winter warfare using heating methods that would keep them effective while their enemies suffered. The stage was set for a confrontation that would test not just military strength, but the fundamental question of whether innovation could triumph over raw power. However, heating systems were only part of the Song advantage. Their engineers had also developed weapons that seemed to come from another age entirely. The most devastating of these were the thunder crash bombs, devices that combined gunpowder, sulphur and quicklime into packages of destruction unlike anything the world had seen. These weren't simple explosives. When a thunder crash bomb detonated, it created three simultaneous effects. A thunderous blast that could be heard for miles, a burst of flame that ignited everything nearby, and a cloud of caustic lime powder that blinded anyone caught in its path. The psychological impact was as devastating as the physical damage. The Song had also perfected something even more remarkable, paddle wheel warships powered by human muscle. These vessels used teams of sailors running on treadmills below deck to turn massive paddle wheels on either side of the ship. The largest of these ships had 11 paddle wheels per side, operated by dozens of men working in coordinated shifts. To outside observers, these ships seemed to move by magic. No oars were visible. No sails caught the wind. The vessels could surge forward, stop suddenly, or pivot in place with an agility that defied everything people understood about naval warfare. Enemy commanders watching from shore would see what appeared to be ghost ships gliding across the water with supernatural speed. The paddle wheel system solved a crucial tactical problem. Traditional ships depended on wind and current, making them predictable and vulnerable. Song paddle wheelers could attack from unexpected directions, retreat against unfavorable winds, and maintain precise formations regardless of weather condition. November 26th, 1161, dawn breaks cold and gray over the Yangtze River at a crossing point called Kaishi. On the northern shore, hundreds of gin boats crowd the water's edge. Cavalry horses stamp nervously on wooden decks. Armoured warriors grip their weapons and stare across the dark water toward the southern bank. Emperor Wan Yan Liang stands on his command vessel, watching the first wave of boats push off into the current. The crossing has begun. Victory seems within reach, but the Song are ready. Hidden behind a small island in the river's bend, paddle wheel warships wait in perfect silence. Their crews have spent the night in relative comfort, warmed by braziers and sustained by hot food prepared on their enclosed stoves. While Jin soldiers shivered in open boats, Song sailors rested in heated cabins, maintaining the alertness and coordination that would prove decisive in the coming battle. A signal flag appears on the island's peak. In an instant, the Song fleet surges into view, 
the Jin soldiers watch in amazement as ships appear to glide across the water without visible means of propulsion. No oars break the surface, no sails catch the wind. The vessels move with ghostly precision, closing the distance with impossible speed. Then the thunder begins. The first thunder crash bomb arcs through the morning air and explodes among the crowded gin boats with a sound like the sky splitting open. Sulfur ignites in brilliant yellow flames. Lime powder billows outward in a choking cloud. Men and horses cry out as the caustic dust burns their eyes and throats. More bombs follow. The Song trebuchets launch their deadly cargo with mechanical precision, while paddle wheel ships maneuver for optimal firing positions. Each explosion sends shockwaves through the Jin formation, but the psychological impact proves even more devastating than the physical destruction. The Jin warriors have never encountered anything like this. They understand arrows and swords, cavalry charges and siege engines. But these weapons seem to harness the power of storms themselves. The very air becomes their enemy as lime clouds blind them and the thunder of explosions drowns out all attempts at coordination. Panic spreads through the Jin fleet. Horses, driven mad by the noise and burning powder, leap overboard or overturn boats in their terror. Armoured cavalry so dominant on land, become helpless passengers as their vessels founder in the icy water. The weight of their armour drags them down into the dark current. Meanwhile, song crews continue their work with calm efficiency. Their heating systems have kept them comfortable and alert through the cold night. Their hands are steady on their weapons. Their coordination remains perfect as they press their attack with methodical precision. The contrast couldn't be more stark. On one side, an army suffering from cold, confusion and terror. On the other, sailors working in warmth and comfort, executing tactics they've practiced for years. By midday, the Jin invasion has become a rout. Hundreds of boats burn or sink in the Yangtze's current. Thousands of elite warriors have perished in the icy water. Emperor Wan Yan Liang himself barely escapes capture wounded and humiliated as his grand army disintegrates around him. The Song victory is so complete that it seems almost impossible. A force of 18,000 has shattered an invasion army 10 times larger. The secret wasn't just superior weapons or better ships. It was the accumulated advantage of dozens of small innovations, from heating systems that kept crews effective to paddle wheels that provided tactical flexibility. But the story doesn't end with the battle. Two weeks later, Wan Yan Liang's own officers assassinate him in his tent, their loyalty shattered by the disaster at Kaishi. The Jin invasion collapses entirely. The Song dynasty, which had seemed doomed to extinction, survives to flourish for another century. The heating methods that helped win this victory would spread throughout Asia as the Mongols later conquered both Jin and Song territories. When Kublai Khan attempted his invasions of Japan, his fleets carried Chinese-designed ships with Chinese heating systems and Chinese-invented gunpowder weapons. The technology that saved the Song would eventually be turned against them, but by then it had already changed naval warfare forever. The question that began our journey, how did ancient Chinese naval forces heat their ships without fire? reveals something profound about the nature of military innovation. The Song Dynasty didn't just solve a technical problem, they reimagined what naval warfare could be. Their heating systems represented a fundamental shift in thinking. Instead of accepting that sailors must suffer in cold conditions, Song engineers asked why suffering was necessary at all. Instead of viewing comfort as luxury, they recognised it as a tactical advantage. Instead of fearing fire, they learned to control it. This approach extended far beyond heating. Song naval technology included watertight compartments that prevented sinking, magnetic compasses that enabled navigation in poor visibility, and standardised weapons production that ensured reliable performance. Each innovation built upon the others, creating a system of naval warfare that wouldn't be matched anywhere else in the world for centuries.
The broader lesson transcends military history. The song victory at Kaashi demonstrates that survival often depends not on matching an enemy's strengths, but on developing capabilities they never considered. While the Jin perfected cavalry warfare, the Song perfected naval warfare. While the Jin focused on conquest, the Song focused on innovation. In the end, the ancient Chinese solved the problem of heating ships without fire through a combination of engineering brilliance and strategic thinking that transformed weakness into strength. Their charcoal braziers, hand stoves and enclosed heating systems kept crews warm and effective while enemies suffered and perished in the cold. But perhaps the most remarkable thing about this story is how completely it was forgotten. For centuries, the Battle of Kaishi remained buried in Chinese historical records, while the West celebrated naval victories that were far less innovative and decisive. Only now are we beginning to understand the true scope of medieval Chinese naval technology and its impact on world history. The Song Dynasty's approach to the challenge of heating ships without fire reminds us that the most important breakthroughs often come from questioning assumptions that everyone else takes for granted. Sometimes the greatest victories are won not by those who fight hardest, but by those who think differently about what fighting means. Subscribe if you'd like to explore more stories of forgotten innovations that change the course of history.